Hey, people. <laughs> How y'all doing? <laughs> Welcome to another chapter of the Book of Sean. So listen, there's a lot going on in the world. There's a lot going on in the world. You know what I'm saying? I got, we got a lot to talk about. I'm going to do some headlines with you tonight. My dear brother Gerald is here. You know, I can't wait to talk to him. I haven't had a chance to say hello to him at all, but I get, I get, a, I get the sense that Gerald has, a, has an interesting story. And not just because I know what the story is, but also because I think his story is relatable. There's so many people who are living with a part of themselves that they know the world needs to see. They're just a little bit intimidated about what the rest of y'all are going to think of it. You know what I'm saying? Fear is a real thing. Fear is a real thing. And my dear brother Gerald is here tonight to talk about his, his journey with that, right? And if you say you ain't got no fear, you're lying. <laughs> Everybody's scared of something. Anyway, let's do some headlines right now. So, listen. You guys know, uh, you heard of Stuart Rhodes. You know who he is, Stuart Rhodes. Stuart Rhodes is the founder of the Oath Keepers, uh, and he has been ordered to remain in jail while he uh, is waiting and while his trial is pending for seditious conspiracy. <laughs> so Mr. Founder and leader of the Oath Keepers is, uh, you know, he's in jail tonight, which, by the way, let me just say, is where he should be, Okay. I, I, if, if a man gets up and allegedly, because I got to say allegedly, they want me to say allegedly on the show tonight. If he allegedly conspired to not allow Joe Biden to be sworn in, that guy right there who looks like a conspirator, he looks like a pirate. <laughs> oh, my God. Anyway, if, if Mr. Stuart Rose is the leader of the Oath Keeper. If he conspired, allegedly conspired, to prevent Joe Biden from being sworn in, his ass should be in jail. You know what I'm saying? Where else should he be? Let me just ask you a question. If I conspired to overthrow the government, where do you think I would be right now? You think they just let me go home? You think after I got a rain, they'd be like, oh, Sean, go on home. We'll see you in two months. You really think that would happen? If I conspired, allegedly, <laughs> to overthrow an inauguration, to storm the Capitol, you think they just let me go home? Me. 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 <laughs> no, they wouldn't let me go home. So why is Mr. Pirate, <laughs> Stuart Rhodes, show his picture again, because I swear he looks like a pirate. Why, 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 why should he go? Y'all gonna show the picture? What y'all doing back there? Why, 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 why would y'all let him go home? He looks like he should be behind somebody's bars. Okay? Let me just say this. Black people suffered in this country for 300 years. We've suffered in this country for 300 years, and we never overthrew the government. We never showed up at the Capitol to take over the building or to prevent an inauguration. And we had every right to. You understand what I'm saying? After slavery and the end of Reconstruction, Jim Crow, lynching, segregation, anti-blackness, police terrorism, redlining, go down the list. We had every reason to want to overthrow the government, and we never did it. And these people lose one election and then lose their minds. We 300 years, 300 years of oppression and suffering, and we never tried to overthrow the government, though some of us wanted to. <laughs> these people lose one election. And they got pirates out there like Stuart Rhodes losing their minds and trying to overthrow the government. And you know why? It's because they never believed in democracy to begin with. They never believed in democratic principles. And you know how they know that you know how you know they never believed in them? Because when those principles got tested and they lost, they threw the principles out and they just reached for power. Let me tell you something. If you only believe in your principles when it's not difficult to believe in your principles then you don't believe in your principles. Because you don't have principles when everything is going well. You don't have principles when you're winning. Your principles are when your world is falling apart and you're losing and you can't find your footing. Then you need your principles. Belief is not for when life is going well. Belief is when life is going wrong. That's when you got to hold on to something. And I'm telling you to your face, you don't know what somebody really believes until they start losing. You don't know what somebody really believes and still thinks, until things start going wrong. Wait till they start losing and then you'll see what they believe. Wait until they get in trouble. That's when the principles, what they really stand for, will come out. Don't watch people when they win. Watch people when they lose. Because when it's all said and done, the truth comes out in defeat. 
And when we were being raped and pillaged and dispossessed and disillusioned, black folks never gave up on our principles because in spite of our problems and our difficulties and our complexities, we are after all, underneath it all, a righteous people. Let's move on from the pirate. <laughs> Let's talk about Yale. Let's talk about, y'all know how I feel about Yale. I hope Gerald didn't go to Yale. I don't know. Let's talk about Yale. But anyway, Yale Law School has announced that it will cover the full tuition and fees for all of its low income student, low income law students. And I hate to say this because I have an affection for that school in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, but shout out to Yale. And you know how much it hurts me to say shout out. Thievo's over there because they moved the set again. They, 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 they don't know what the hell they want to do with the set. But he's back over here. Thievo, you know how much I don't like to give Yale a shout out. But shout out to Yale, people. Okay? I'm just saying. I, I, I think this is great because the standard should be merit and not money. If, if you have the ability and you have the, ta the talent and the capacity, uh, income should not be a reason for you not to get a first class education. Okay? If you have the mind for it, you should have access to a first class education. There's no reason why you shouldn't have it. But in this country, access and privilege will trump talent and ability every single time. It, it's not the best and the brightest getting access to a great education. It's the rich and the powerful and the wealthy. If you can afford to go to Yale or Harvard or Princeton or Morehouse or whatever, if you can afford to go to those schools, you can get in and go. I, I, I don't know what city Gerald is from, but I, I was born and raised in New York City. And I was born, in, uh, I was born in, in Brooklyn and eventually taken to Kings County Hospital. And I, I wasn't born into wealth. I wasn't born with a silver spoon in my mouth. I was born into a struggling economy. <laughs> But I had a first class mind and the creator opened doors for me that no man could close. But it shouldn't take an intervention of God for somebody who is talented and gifted to have an opportunity in this country. God shouldn't have to step in <laughs> for smart people and gifted people to have a shot at being smart and gifted in a country supposedly built on merit. Oh, my God. The biggest threat to America isn't Russia. The biggest threat to America is the lack of opportunity. And if people don't have a shot at a better life, you know what they'll do? They will destroy the lives that they have. And if the rich only have access to wealth and education, then what do you think happens to people who don't have ed access to education at all? What happens to people who don't have access to a first class education? Well, you don't have to guess. All you got to do is look at your social media and you will see all over social media what happens to people when they don't have access to education. You got people licking toilets. <laughs> you got people fighting, beating the hell out of each other on airplanes. You got people doing the same damn dance a hundred thousand times thinking they talented because they can lip sync a song. That's what happens when you don't have education. <laughs> Oh my God, let's move on, because I'm running out of time. Let's talk about Uganda. You guys know the country of Uganda, don't you? It's in Africa. There you go, Uganda. So I know a lot of y'all are still not supporting the vaccine and you don't like the vaccine and you're not, you anti-vaxxers, I understand. You know, it's, and it's your, listen, it's your right to be goofy. I'm all for it. I support you and your right to be goofy. I'm not knocking you at all. Don't take the term goofy to be pejorative. It just means you're having a good time because I think you're goofy. But let me just say this. I support the full manifestation of your rights and all of that. You ain't got to get vaccinated. Whatever. Whatever. But I got, I got some advice for you. Don't take your ass to Uganda. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, God. The African country of Uganda has proposed, check this out, steep penalties for anti-vaxxers. They have proposed astronomical fines and jail time <laughs> for people who are anti-vaxxers. So you can go to Uganda all you want talking about you don't believe in the vaccine, but you end up in jail one afternoon messing around in Uganda, okay? Okay, let me just make it clearly, just so everybody's watching before I get in trouble. I do not support putting people in jail for not being vac vaccinated, okay? For vaccinated, rather. I do not support putting people in jail for not being vaccinated. Let me just say it again, so I don't want to get sued. I do not support putting people in jail for not being vaccinated. But you better stay away from Uganda. <laughs> oh, my God. I don't know why that's 
is so funny to me. I, and I think this is important so that people understand this. Just because you have an idea in your head, in your little part of the world, doesn't mean that's, a, that's how people are thinking about it in their little part of the world. You know what I'm saying? Your values and your principles are not universal. So your little personal freedom, I want to be free, don't tread on me. You know, just because that's how you think, doesn't mean that that's how the people in Uganda think, okay? So don't be going all the different parts of the world trying to superimpose your values, your principles, and your beliefs on, on other people because you think, you know, how you think is universal. How about this? Just because you believe it doesn't make it right. That was good. That was good, Steve-O. You ain't saying nothing back there, but it was still good. Just because you believe it don't make it right, people. All right? Write this down. A belief is not a justification. <laughs> It's not true because you believe it. It just means that's what you believe. Ain't nothing wrong with believing it, but it doesn't make it true and it doesn't make it right. So don't go over to Uganda talking about personal freedom, liberty, because apparently Uganda operates under a different moral presupposition, collective working responsibility. In Uganda, the health of the collective it's just as important as the health of the individual. That is a thought, an African thought. <laughs> All right, let me end this because I, I was supposed to do my last headline. I'm checking the time because I can't see a clock. I was, uh, I, was, uh, I was supposed to do my last headline on Donald Trump's silly app that's not working. Remember I told you he has a new app called True Social and, and in true fashion, it ain't even working. <laughs> He's got a new app that's not working, just like his presidency. But I thought there's no way, take him down. There's no way, there's no way I could possibly, you're going to need him in a second. There's no way I could possibly avoid what's going on in Russia and the Ukraine. Because the state of the world as it is is something that needs to be talked about. And my first response to what's going on in the Ukraine and Russia, now put Trump back up, is what would the world be like if he was still president right now? <laughs> if this nut was still in the White House, can you imagine? the kind of craziness that will be going on right now with Russia invading Ukraine. Okay, you can say what you want to say about Joe Biden, but here's the one thing we all can say. He is at least rational and measured. He may be a lot of things that we don't like, but he is at least not crazy. Okay, and he's shown, proven himself thus far to be very measured, very rational. And, 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 and listen, don't tell me that elections don't matter because they do matter. Because if Trump was the president right now, we all know the situation would be a hundred times worse and God only knows where the war will be going from here. But let's take it from a moral perspective because I'm not a politician. From a moral perspective, once again, what's going on in Russia and the Ukraine has proven that human beings are incapable of living together without violence and war. That ego and greed are the default setting for human beings and in this case, Europeans, far too often and for far too long. Once again, we are back at the brink of war. States and nation states pointing guns at each other and thousands of people on the brink, hundreds of people on the brink, too many people on the brink of dying and being needlessly killed so that somebody's ego can be, can be aggrandized. Somebody's ego, greed and pettiness. And as long as we're willing to kill people for oil and for land and for money and for profit and prestige, this planet and our species will always be in peril. Most Americans don't know what it is to wake up in your, with your country at war, in spite of the fact that this country was at war perpetually for 20 years. But when we wage war, we don't wage war in our country. We go to other people's country and blow them up. This country doesn't, we don't know what it is to wake up one morning in the state of Washington is at war with Canada. Or to wake up one morning in the state of New Mexico is at war with Mexico. And so we have no idea what the Ukrainian people are going through. But I'm telling you, the level of fear and anxiety must be off the roof. I mean, off the charts. That's a better way to say it. God. Imagine waking up one morning and realizing that your country's being invaded and you didn't even do anything to, to get it invaded. What did you do to get your country invaded? Oh, there's another country who could say that, Iraq. Because Putin is taking a page out of our playbook. We invaded Iraq for absolutely no reason. And the people of Iraq can say exactly what the people of Ukraine are saying about Putin. They could say about us. 
What in the world did we do to get invaded and have our government toppled and our worlds turned upside down? But let's remember this one thing. You can't, rem- you can't measure the impact of this emerging war with dollars and cents. I know in America we make everything about money, but everything is not about money. And you can't measure the impact of this conflict in gas prices. And I'll tell you why. The old proverb, African proverb says that when the elephants fight, it's the grass that suffers. And here's what I want you to remember. Then we're going to take this break. Here's what I want you to remember. When great European powers fight, it's black and brown people who die disproportionately. When great European powers go into world wars, it's poor countries around the world who end up suffering disproportionately. So in this conflict, remember, if you ain't European, you ain't the elephant. You the grass. Can you imagine knowing that you are blessed, knowing that you are gifted, knowing that you have something special? How about this? Can you imagine not knowing that you're blessed, not knowing that you're gifted and not knowing that you have something special, but still feeling the urge and sometimes the unction to step out and to do something significant with your life. What a strange configuration of emotion. It's like someone who's scared to be alone and scared to be in a relationship. We all have fears. We all have things that we're running from. Experiences that have defined us in ways we should not be defined. I guess tonight, he knows that journey, and I'm glad to have him here. Welcome to the show tonight, Gerald Radford. Hey, Gerald, how you doing, brother? I'm great, Sean. How are you? I'm doing very well. Thank you for coming on, man. I appreciate your your smile and your energy already. My pleasure. Listen, listen. So let's get, let let's get right into it, okay? Let's get right into it. Um, I know you're here to talk about a set of fears, a set of apprehensions, a set of intrepidations that you have. And so I, I, just, I want I, just so we can level set and everybody could be on the same page. What exactly are you apprehensive about? What is the nature of the apprehension? The nature of my apprehension would be failure. I have a fear of failure. Uh, I seldom go after the things that I want because I may fail. Sure, I may succeed as well, but I have an aversion to the thought, the very idea of not succeeding so i kind of stay in the comfort zone yes i feel that every night on this show during my monologue i think to myself this could really crash and burn <laughs> or this could really be great i don't know <laughs> so okay so good 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 i'm, I'm making light because i want to make sure you're comfortable so i'm throwing some jokes in there because I, I i want you to know that you're in safe hands you're in good hands and i'm not here to interrogate you right i'm not here to you know make you uh feel judged in any way because i know what it is to, I, I trust me i know what it is to, to live with that but here's what i want to know right now what is the history of that emotion like where did you get this from can you track it well if i were to track it i'd say very early on i kind of learned that i wasn't of that much value and uh, that may sound uh pretty pathetic, <laughs> but I, I did learn that messaging, I guess, and it was like a building block for me. So I kind of took that into the trajectory of my life and it taught me to just accept what came to me as opposed to going after things, because I guess I didn't feel like I deserved to go after things. And when did you know that this feeling was a problem? When did you know that, okay, this has become a problem? Well, I guess when I look back over my journey, and I've done a lot of things. I've done a lot of things. Um, And I've really lived somewhat of a a blessed life, but I discovered that everything I did was something that came to me. It fell in my lap. And none of it, or I say 95% of it, I did not pursue myself. There were things that were lying dormant in me that I thought about regularly, but I just never had the... um, guts i guess to pursue any of that so if you give me something and you know put it in my lap again i'll take it and i'll run with it and i'll perform i'll do everything to make it successful but the things that really matter to me at a heart level they just kind of stay there Mm, that's interesting that's interesting you also said something interesting before that i want to come back to um because you almost told me the story 
but then you but then you climbed up in your head <laughs> and gave me the idea. Go back into the story. So so tell me tell me what is the origin? What is the story behind you feeling like you were not good enough, not valued, not important? So, you know, my father, God rest his soul, you know, he wasn't a part of my life when I was growing up. My mom was there. She was the best. She was super loving and supportive and, you know, it was almost to the point of embarrassment how much she supported me. But significantly, uh, as significantly, my father was not there and I knew he wasn't there. I was well aware of that. And the circumstances surrounding him not being there are what taught me that I was of no value. I have to go back to a conversation that I overheard between my mom and my dad when he just showed up one day out of the blue. Um, I think I was in like the eighth grade or something. And she asked him a question of, when are you going to start taking care of your son? And his response was, he has a vehicle to take care of. Now, I mean, that, that sounds strange, but you know, he was super into cars and that kind of thing. So the messaging to me was that an inanimate object was more important than I was. So I internalized that. And again, I was very young. He didn't know I heard it because I was in another room, uh, just kind of eavesdropping. But uh, I took that with me throughout the entirety of my life. And now I find myself um, with a, or well, I've amassed a lot of experiences, but again, all of them are inherently below who I really am. Yeah, um, Jared, Jer, hold on one second, because you're doing, you're, first of all, you're doing such a great job, by the way. I mean, it's it's it's, you know, it's such a it's such an important conversation we're having. But I ju I just want to slow you down just a little bit because I want you to drill down on what that what hearing that did to you. What did it say to you? How did it make you feel? What did it give birth to in you? So it made me retreat. It made me, um, I guess, become numb to feeling, or if not that, have an aversion to being hurt. And I associate being hurt with failing. So those two things are kind of synonymous to me. So with that, I never really developed a plan for my life. I just started surviving. I was thinking, um, if I'm not of any value, at least I can protect how I feel, you know, protect mm -hmm. the things that, you know, I allow to shape my emotions. So I, again, just started moving through my life and doing whatever it was that came to me. And um, it, I think it has really been to my detriment. Again, not that I haven't experienced anything great because I have. I've, yeah, you know, yeah no, I, 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 I totally get what you're saying. I, I, what, what I hear you saying is you have been, you've, you've been blessed, you've done well, you've had exciting times. But if you were honest with yourself, you know that there are things you could have reached for and went for that you didn't reach for or go for because you heard something at a certain stage of your life that dimmed your light, it darkened your sky, it limited your horizon. And I'm loving this because there's so many people who have had the same experience. Maybe they didn't hear what you heard, but they, they somebody gave them a look, somebody didn't treat them the right way, somebody cheated on them, whatever it was, and it made them second guess themselves. Am I getting this right? You are absolutely right. Yes, yes, and, 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 and here, here's why this is important, because let's, 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 let's just, to just to oppose this, with the dream so we have the reality of your life tell me this if you could have done anything with your life no fear no recrimination no shame money wasn't a problem time wasn't an issue age wasn't a barrier it's not a barrier what do you wish you were doing well uh, i would be an author number one that is something that's uh super important to me uh value the way I express myself. And uh, I've always wanted to write books, but there is a paralysis there because I don't feel uh, like I will achieve the perfection mm. <laughs> that I'd be looking for. So uh, I think that th those experiences from the past also taught me that I would have to be perfect in order to achieve certain things. And if I didn't value myself, I never thought perfection uh, possible. So I just stopped in a that's where I sit. Mm. Mm. Tell me how much you know about the difference between fear and danger. Well, fear is more the thought of danger. 
think danger is more of a present experience. So fear is something that you project. You really don't know what's going to occur. <laughs> Not completely differently than you perceive, but uh, danger is when there is a very real threat of it. Yeah, yeah, no, no, perfect, perfect. I, I, I can, I can hear your writer's mind. I like, I, I, I liken it to this. Um, danger is a knife. Fear is the shadow of a knife. Right. So danger is to be in the presence of a knife. Fear is to be in the shadow of a knife. One makes sense, the other does not. The one is rational and the other is irrational. One is totally appropriate and the one is just something somebody told you we picked up somewhere we learned to be afraid of the shadow. Which one in your case do you think it is? Is it the knife or the shadow? 100% the shadow. Mm. Now when you say that, what are you feeling? I see the smile. What are you <laughs> feeling? What are you sensing when you say that? <laughs> Well, there's just a, a lot of uh, self-sabotage. I never even allowed myself to get in position to achieve, again, the very real things that are, are dear to my heart. Again, I've achieved some things that were handed to me, but as far as the things that are in my heart, you know, I absolutely walk in the shadow, you know, of fear. And um, that just keeps me, uh, again, paralyzed. Yeah, yeah. And you know what's so ironic about this? You are, you are, you are a strong, you are uh, a clearly a brilliant, well-spoken. You manifest yourself in, a, in an amazing way uh, in this moment, in this interview, in this conversation. I don't even know you, but I have a high regard for just for how you manifest, just for how you appear in this moment. And the amazing thing is, is that you can be as strong as you are and as competent and accomplished as you are. And because you've heard one thing at the wrong time in the wrong way, in the wrong stage of your life, it can undermine all of that ability and all of that accomplishment. And, and it just, I, my, my point is this, Gerald, um, what would you say to people who are saying things around children and don't know what the children are hearing? Be very, very careful what you say uh, to a child because uh, again, children are basically building blocks to their life at that stage of their life. and one of those blocks no matter how you know surrounded by uh the good information that one bad block can become a part of the structure the foundation and it can make it weak and no matter what you put on top of it, it is weak because you have that one particular block that sticks with you and unfortunately we tend to uh stick to or, or the those bad the bad information tends to resonate with you more than the good information does as you grow yeah, listen, man, I got to take this break. Let me tell you all something. I was I was uh, I was abandoned by my parents, left in a garbage can and adopted by a 57 year old woman who took me into her home. And I had every reason to feel horrible about myself, because if your biological family don't want you, then who does? But that woman from Edgefield County, South Carolina, sat me down almost every other day of my life. And when she fed me oatmeal, she fed me dignity. She fed me strength and she looked me in my face and told me you're gifted, you're blessed, you're going somewhere. She called me a major prophet before I knew what a major prophet was. And the only reason that I don't manifest in my life with a form of fear and weaknesses is because somebody said to me when I needed to hear it most, you're blessed. <laughs> that was my fault. I jumped in before it was time. All right, Gerald, let's get back. Let's get back to our conversation, Gerald. I'm, I'm, I'm off with my cues today. Um, before, before, I, before I went to break, I, I sort of took you into my story, right? And, and part of the reason why I can, I can relate so much to you is because I actually was a very insecure, a very apprehensive child. I was not rushing out into the world. And my mom knew that she had to feed me courage and bravery, right? And, and so she did that. And, and part of me just, just longs for you to have had that experience. Like, I so want to apologize to you, you know, for what your father said. And I want to, I, I always want to apologize to the man that he was at in that moment, right? Uh, maybe he got better, maybe he didn't get better, but just in that moment, he was just not what you needed. And that was just not what you needed to hear. And I don't know if anybody's ever apologized to you on behalf of all of the adults of, because I'm a father now, right? So on behalf of all the dads, you know, who we who endeavor to love our kids. Has anybody ever said to you, 
You didn't deserve to hear that. It wasn't true. Um, that was him projecting his values about what was important to him, but it had nothing to do with you? No, I mean, uh, I normally keep everything close to my vest, so I've never really shared that story uh, the way I have today. And uh, it's it feels strange to do so. <laughs> but no, nobody has ever said those words to me. And when you said it, it kind of hit me like a lightning bolt. So mm. I, I appreciate that. I mm. receive it. No, I'm, I'm, I'm glad for that because it wasn't your fault and you didn't do anything wrong. And again, I'm just going to say it because I just think it's good for the soul to have to have a reiteration of the truth that whatever you heard was not about you. It was about like you, you caught a You caught a you caught a snapshot of a conversation, just a moment of a conversation. You don't know what came before it. You don't know what came after. Right. You don't know enough about what was going on between the two of them. You know what I'm saying? And I'm saying to you, because you because you really said it to us tonight, that we have to be so careful what we say around kids because a child will take something and build a whole identity on it. Am I right? Absolutely. Is, is that what you did? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. I still carry, though, carry that one block with me today. It's in my pocket, everything I do. And I, uh, that's unfortunate, but I, I plan to get rid of it today. Yes. <laughs> okay. So let, let's start that because 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 as soon as you said that, here's what jumped up in my spirit. And just respond to this. Just because you heard it doesn't mean you still have to believe it. That's correct. Come on, tell. give me more than correct. What are, what are you feeling? <laughs> give me more. Give me something. Yeah, I feel um, like now my mindset is to give myself permission to let it go, uh, to understand that, like you said, it was just a snapshot. And who knows what was going on between them to make him say what he said but it was never meant for me to internalize. It wasn't meant for me to hear in the first place, but certainly wasn't meant for me to internalize because um, I was sent here, you know, as a, a player in this world to do my part mm -hmm. and came here with certain endowments, certain gifts, and it's my responsibility really to share those with the world. Mm. Are you I'm, 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 I'm going to ask something of a slightly personal question. Are you a believer? Are you are you a practice in any kind of faith? I am. I okay. believe in God. Okay, yeah. good. Okay, good. Because so, what I want to do is sort of go down that line for a little while. And here's what I'm saying. All right. Okay. You have a mother, obviously, right? You, you've, you've had a father, obviously, right? Um, and you have other relatives. But you also have a God. And there's a difference, right? Absolutely. Okay. So, so just, 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 just walk with me, walk with me, Gerald, walk with me through here. So what your father says about you, while impactful and important, can that compare to what your God says about you? Which one knows more? In, in that um, context, God, absolutely. My you, creator. Your sure. cre yeah, your creator. I would agree. Your creator knows more about you, right? So whatever your creator says about you is probably more indelible, more true, more lasting, and here's the point that I'm making, more impactful. Okay, let, let's put it all together. When you can't find the words that you need to come out of the mouth of your mother or your father, you can go to your creator who can say to your soul what your spirit needs to hear. Now, you tell me this. You ready? Because we're going to have a good time right now. You tell me this. What does your creator say about you? I know the plans I have for you. Come on prosper you come you on <laughs> come on doc don't stop keep going <laughs> to give you a hope in the future right fearfully and wonderfully created that's right that you're made in the image of the creator right right yes. see these aren't just words i mean these aren't just false platitudes from my perspective and everybody may not agree but i don't i'm not trying to please everybody right from my perspective when your creator has said something to you about you that relates to you it trumps everything everybody else has said. One yes from God can cancel every no you've ever heard in your life. So, here's what I want to ask you. You ready? I'm ready. What do you believe tonight? I believe it's my responsibility at this point to express everything I was sent here to express. That's my takeaway. Okay, stop, stop, stop. What do you deserve tonight? And I deserve, I deserve to succeed. I deserve to excel, to express myself 
as myself. Stop. Last one. What do you think will happen if you win? I think the world could be a, a better place. You know, uh, again, I have a part to play. I play my part. Everybody has a part. I think I can leave my mark on this world, my unique mark, if I give myself permission to do so. And, I, and I'll leave you with this, Gerald, that your success has been bought and paid for. That your success has been bought and paid for. Your success has been bought and paid for. You own it. It is yours. And nobody can take it from you. And what you heard in one stage of your life does not have the power to cancel the rest of your life. Maya Angelou used to say, if you don't pick it up, you don't have to put it down. That means if you don't pick up their praises, you don't have to put down their criticisms. The only word that matters is the word that comes out of your mouth and the mouth of your creator. And I know this for sure, that if you don't write that book, I'm going to slap you with this paper. <laughs> if you don't write that book, I'm going to come get you. You heard what I'm saying to you? Because I like your spirit. I like your energy. And I'm convinced that you have something to say to the world. So, so can we just agree that, it, that, that five, ten years from now, however long it takes you to write, that you're going to start tonight, one sentence at a time, one word at a time. Write your best sentence tonight, and each day, if that's all you got, give it to us. How about that? Absolutely. If I were in the studio, I'd touch. We can touch and agree. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, let's touch. We touch and agree. Come on, there we go. There we go. Listen, <laughs> thanks, man. Th Joe, thank you for coming on. I'm excited about your future. Thank you, everybody who uh, were a part of this conversation. I'm coming right back with some Ask Dr. Sean, and uh, listen, we'll be right back. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, so listen, um, Gerald is an interesting case, at least for... Uh, and so far as I think that, you know, he's going to be OK. And I think as soon as he stops believing what he heard and starts believing what he's hearing now, I think he'll be fine. And how, and how many of us can say the same thing? You know what I'm saying? That we heard something at one stage of our lives only to discover that what we heard was simply not the truth. Just because you got it from a source that you trusted doesn't mean that you should trust what they say all the time. Let's do some Ask Dr. Sean. <laughs> So, you guys always send me great, great questions and great videos. Are we doing the video or are we doing the writing first? I don't know. Video. All right. We said video. Let's do video. Let's watch this video. <laughs> Hi, my name is Sherry Pullum, and I'm from Hackensack, New Jersey. And I am a mom, a wife, a business owner. I love serving my community. I serve on a lot of boards. And before I know it, I feel like I'm out of time. And although I try really hard to say, time is my friend <laughs> most of the time i say it's not my friend because before i know it it's midnight look at what time i'm doing this video so what am i doing wrong dr sean i could really use your help in terms of time management so please what offerings do you have help me dr sean yes listen everybody every everybody who is great at anything or passionate about something ultimately has a problem with time management. Time management is not an easy thing to sort of deal with. And, but the answer to that, is, this isn't very, a, a really complicated question. It, it's, it's, a, it's an intentional uh, answer to a very, I think, indelible question. Here's what I mean. In order to manage your time more effectively, you have to empower yourself to say no to things that you ultimately decide are not as significant as the thing you happen to be doing. You see, you have to adjudicate. You have to say some things are important and some things are more important and this is most important. Human beings today, especially in our, in our world today, we try to love everything equally. We try to love everything and be devoted to nothing. And it doesn't work. That's not how it works. You, you have to be able to order your life and to, deci and to decide rather what your values and priorities are and you have to make those decisions before you get into a tight place. You, you gotta know what you love in the valley on the plane, rather, so that when you get into the valley, you're clear about what you're willing to sacrifice, what you're willing to live for, fight for, die for, and all of that. My point is this. You're never going to have enough time to do all the things you want to do. But you can certainly have all the time that you need to do all the things that are most important to you. And that's just a matter of you deciding that whatever it is that's sort of extra people-pleasing, valuing other people more than you value, that those are the things that have to go. So a healthy dose of being able to say no, 
to set boundaries and borders to your time, to your attention, that is the beginning to having success. Now, the hard part that I'm not saying is reconciling yourself to the fact that you're not going to please everybody and you're going to make some people upset. And maybe that is really at the heart of the inability to manage time. Is that when you want everybody to be happy and you're trying to please everybody, you end up overextending yourself and then nobody's happy with you because there's none of you, there's not enough of you to be invested in what they want you to be invested in and for you to do it well. So let me ask you a question. Are you okay with people being upset? Are you okay disappointing people? Are you okay with saying no? Because if you're not okay with that, then you're probably not going to ever learn what it takes or to do what it takes to manage your time more effectively. Now, I, let me just say this, don't have a problem with that at all. <laughs> I'll tell you no and not care. I'll forget you asked because <laughs> I ain't got no problems with people not liking me. It's quite all right. I like me, and so I'm good. So I wish you well. I think you're going to be all right. Just learn to say no by learning to say yes to the fact that not everybody's going to be happy with you. And that's okay. Everybody's not supposed to like you. It's, it's, it's called the real world. Anyway, let's do this question. Someone DM me. My mother recently passed away. And one day I was going through her personal things when I discovered a DNA, a DNA paperwork uh, providing that she, or proving that she, that the man who raised me, I should be, isn't my biological father. I should say proving is that the man who raised me is my biological father. Okay, I'm hurt and confused and I need answers. What should I do? <laughs> okay, wait a minute, wait a minute. Go back to the top of that for me because I just want to see one thing. Just one thing. Go oh, there you go. My mother passed away. Okay, I was making sure she was dead <laughs> before I answered this question because my answer was going to be go find your mama as soon as you can. But, but my condolences, of course, to the passing away of your mom. Um, this is a pickle, okay? Um, this is a pickle. To find out that your that your dad is not your biological dad, and you can't go to your mom uh, to ask for questions, woo! What do you do with that? What I would suggest is that you uh, do um, more DNA first. First of all, I would decide that you find someone to talk to professional about your feelings about this, okay? Because there's probably a lot of anger with your mom, grief with your mom, resentment with your mom, anger with your dad, all of that, okay? There's probably probably a lot going on with you. So you probably need to get some some counseling with that. And then I would recommend that when you're ready, that you that the, I, there's a name of a of DNA search that you can you can put your DNA in and it just it, it connects with everybody who's ever put that. I, I, I don't I forget what it's called, but you should probably find out, find your family if you're ready, if you want that. And may and maybe there's some people in your life uh, who know the story, because behind every sin is a story behind every mistake is a narrative. Behind every failure is a reason. And before you jump to the conclusions or emotions or feelings, I would invite you to try to understand the story. And remember, it's their story, not your story. And I know it feels like your story, but it really isn't. You are the consequence of their story. And there may have been some things going on in their lives with them that have nothing to do with you. Maybe there's a reason why this narrative was not revealed to you. And it may not make it acceptable, and it may not make it palatable. What it will make is it something that you can learn to live with. The truth you can live with is better than the lie that you have to push against. Welcome back, everybody. Let's do some Ask Dr. Sean. So take a look at this video somebody sent me. Hey, Dr. Sean. My name is Jamari Murray, a.k.a. The Only J. Rowe, and... I have a dilemma, dilemma right now. Okay, okay so, so say that you is a very okay, like like like, like, like you one of those people who can't tell lies. You always have to be very blunt and honest. But for me, it always to some people it come out rude. But for me, I feel like I'm just being honest. So, um, like like I can't stand my sisters, boyfriends, and stuff like that, and. Sometimes, like, they tend to want advice, but they feel like I always being judgmental. So I want to know, like, how can, like, I break it down to say how I want to say it without it coming out being very disrespectful? Thank you. 
<laughs> no, well, thank you for the question. Um, and I have some advice for you. So how about this? If you know how people are going to respond to what you are going to say, and if you know at present you're not quite capable or empowered yet to say it in a different way, then why not avoid putting yourself in the situation altogether? That is to say this. When people come to you, particularly in this case, your sisters come to you for advice. Why don't you decide that you don't want to give it? Not in a mean or rude way, but to say, you know what, I'd rather stay out of your relationship. I'd rather not be involved in that scenario. I will support you every single day and twice on Sunday, but I really don't want to give advice and I really don't want to be involved. One, because, you know, we tend that me giving you advice tends to cause us to have conflict. And I want to be in community and harmony and relationship with you. OK, that would be my best recommendation. Now, if that don't work, if you absolutely feel like you got to say something because you just one of those people that can't not have something to say, then you got to do something even harder. And that is adjust what you have to say to the frequency of the person who needs to hear it. Because you're, if you're speaking on one wavelength and they're down on another wavelength, well, they're never going to be able to hear it. you got to make these two things come together, which means if they're not going to adjust to the way that you speak, you have to adjust to the way that they hear. Or it's not advice. It's just some sort of selfish exercise and self-righteousness because you know you're right. But nobody's going to benefit from your rightness because nobody can hear it. So that's my two pieces of advice. Personally, I would avoid giving people advice that I know don't listen to it. <laughs> and just use the advice as a way to create conflict and drama between me and them. But if I absolutely felt some sort of moral obligation to say something, then I have to figure out, you have to figure out how to say it differently. I say this to people all the time. It's not advice if no one can receive it, if no one can hear it. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes some of the hardest things I have to say on this show, I say it with a sense of humor because I know that you have to make it palatable, right? It's like your mother or your father who put the medicine in applesauce. They, knew you, they know you like applesauce. They know you hate the medicine. If you put the two together, you stand a better chance of being successful. Okay? Everybody's got the grandmama that say you catch more flies with honey than you do vinegar. I, mean, I can give you all the aphorisms you want. The truth of the matter is, listen, number one, stay out of it. But number two, if you got to get in it, get in it with sugar. Put some honey on it, okay? Because the vinegar ain't helping nobody. Here's the last one. Somebody emailed me this. My son's father recently remarried. And while I'm happy for him, I don't want his wife around our son because I overheard her saying mean things about him. I'm assuming the son you mean, not the husband. Can I co-parent with her when I don't trust her? Well, this is a great question. Um, and I think a lot of people are going through this. Um, here, here's my advice. My advice would be for you to take the information that you've heard uh, back to your ex-husband, uh, to, to, your, to your child's father, and to let him know exactly what you heard so that he can sort of make the corrections and the dynamic of his relationship so that your son, you can feel good about your son, both of your son, being around this new person in this dynamic. Um, let me say this to you clearly. You're not co-parenting with her. You're co-parenting with him. He is the father. You are the mother. And while she is uh, either the stepmother or whatever term you may use, she's a part of the of the circle of family. She's a part of the parenting dynamic. Right. Um, I, I think it's a misnomer to think that you're co-parenting with her uh, because you're not. At the end of the day, you as the kid's mom and he has the kid's dad. What the two of you decide is what's going to happen. Um, I do think it's important that um, that you be able to trust her and more so that the child can trust uh, being around her and that your ex-husband, your baby's father knows that there's a trust issue there. Now, let me say something hard and difficult. OK, you ready? I also think it's important that you make sure that what you heard is exactly what you heard in the spirit that you heard it, because sometimes we can assign sort of moral energy, we can assign negativity or even positivity to a statement based upon a relationship that we have with the person or someone connected to the person. Okay. 
I'm, I'm taking on good faith that what you heard is something that would really make you not want to trust her. And I'm hoping that what you heard wasn't just something that sort of belies or relays the truth of the conflict you have with him. You get what I'm saying, okay? So whatever the case may be, just make sure you talk to, to him. Talk, talk to your ex and the two of you keep that open line of communication. And I wouldn't say to him, I don't trust her. I would just say to him, this is what I heard. What do you think about that? I think if you do that, that's enough. Don't get into, I don't trust her. And I think she's going to hell. And she ain't no good. Or you should, don't get into none of that, okay? Don't say, I don't trust her. Just say, hey, Bob, Leroy, Thomas, this is what I heard. What do you think about that? Anyway, thank you guys for watching tonight. Thank you, Gerald, for being a part of this show. Good show tonight, all right? We're praying for the people of Ukraine and the people of Uganda. <laughs> my new favorite place. <laughs> Y'all be good to each other. I'll see you soon. I love you.